Hey, Bill. Hi, Rick. I was on mute. Sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Give me just a little bit of time here. We're going to still let some people come in and then we will get started. Hi, Joy. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. For everyone who is just now getting in here, we're going to give it just one more moment and we will get started. We're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the Quincy Area Chamber of Commerce, Great River Economic Development Foundation, and the district uh, for our community partner member Q&A featuring esteemed guest, Dr. Rick Noble, interim chief medical officer at Quincy Medical Group. If you have any questions, please place them in the chat box and Joy or Sarah will help to get those questions answered. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Rick Noble so he can get started here. Oh, hold on real quick, Dr. Noble, you are on mute. See if you can take yourself off mute. I, there we go. There we are. There I am. I'm still a rookie at this. <laughs> so, hey, uh, my name is Rick Noble, and uh, I am the Interim Chief Medical Officer at Quincy Medical Group. Um, I've been in Quincy since uh, 1983, uh, joined Quincy uh, Medical Group in 1986, and have been with the organization since then. So I'm really pleased to uh, uh, have you guys uh, uh, invite me into your offices or homes today. Uh, I won't take a lot of your time because I know that it's a Monday morning and you're busy. Um, but today's topic is uh, a pretty uh, fascinating topic. Uh, we'll hit on some highlights. And then what I really like to do is just kind of open it up to any questions, whether it's uh, in the chat or verbally, um, because you may have questions yourself or uh, loved ones, uh, family, friends may have had questions pertaining to the COVID vaccine. So uh, if I can uh, answer them, I definitely will. Um, but I'm always uh, somebody that practices medicine that if I don't have the answer today, I can always find it out for you. Uh, we have great resources uh, here uh, as well as online with CDC and, and other resources. So, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, if you uh, haven't lived under a rock yet. You've, uh, you know, COVID has been the primary um, uh, media stories over the last year, and uh, and we're really excited that the, about the fact that the vaccine is now here. 
Um, I know that Jared Welch uh, and uh, his team at the Adams County Health Department has done an amazing job in attempting to use whatever allotments that uh, we get from IDPH to get it out into the community, first starting with the uh, long-term care um, uh, providers and then uh, healthcare providers. And now I believe we're, we're vaccinating the 65-year-olds and above and moving into the school systems and other essential uh, uh, patients who require it. So um, they've done a great job, uh, endless hours of work, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate everybody uh, who's, who continues to support them. So at the present time, um, there is not one COVID vaccine that is approved by the FDA. They are approved for emergency use authorization, but they have not completely gone through the approval process uh, by the FDA. So under certain times of emergency, the FDA uh, is granted the ability to utilize treatments or vaccines under an emergency use authorization. And that's where both of these COVID-19 uh, vaccines fall into. And that's where you'll probably see uh, the next uh, uh, one to two or upwards of three vaccines fall into the use category is that prior to completing the uh, phases of studies, the FDA basically weighs risk versus benefit. And in these cases, the benefits significantly outweighed the risk before the finishing of the studies and they granted the emergency use authorization. So the two out there, uh, as you probably know, is uh, uh, from Pfizer, uh, by, um, BioNTech and, and Moderna. Um, that they both have an efficacy. Um, Pfizer is around 95% uh, effective in preventing a COVID infection and Moderna is 94.1% and that's all based on their ongoing clinical trials. So there's really no difference in the uh, effectiveness of either vaccine. I, I, I tend to have a lot of patients ask me, which one should I get? And I just reassure patients, either of them, uh, the availability of either one is what you should be getting and because there's no difference to the patient at all as far as overall effectiveness. A few little things that really um, uh, pertain to patients is the Pfizer vaccine can be given to anyone who's 16 years of age and older, Moderna, 18 years of age and older. Otherwise, the difference uh, is in the storage, the packaging, how, uh, how frozen you have to keep the vaccine, and that really is behind the scenes and doesn't really uh, affect uh, uh, patients. Um, the, other, the other biggest difference is both are two-step vaccines, which are which is really really highly recommended. So it's always it's, we just stress to patients you have to get both uh, of your uh, vaccine injections. The Pfizer vaccine can be given. Uh, it is recommended three weeks from the first vaccine, and the Moderna is recommended at four weeks from the first vaccine. Remember, COVID as well as the vaccines are a very fluid situation. And what they've been able to find now is that, um, uh, is that if, you, if you receive the vaccine four days, upwards of four days before your due date, it really doesn't change the effectiveness of the vaccine. It's considered to be uh, that, that you're fully immunized and you do not need to repeat the series. If for some reason, a patient were to have received the second vaccine before the grace period of four days, they don't recommend repeating it, but they, but they, the studies will, uh, well, uh, there's no studies right now that show whether that we need to monitor antibody levels on these patients or not. So basically it just comes down to try as, and get the second vaccine as close to the recommendations of three weeks for Pfizer, four weeks for Moderna. And the CDC and the FDA have now recently, as of within the last week, have even now stated that you can get it outwards of six weeks from your first uh, injection and you're gonna be fine so far. So that situation will be really fluid as we continue to monitor the patients in the vaccine trials uh, and, and see how long their antibody levels, when they reach maximum levels, and how long that uh, they last. But right now, around three to four weeks, but it can be given out to of six weeks uh, from the first, vac uh, from the first uh, shot that you get. But again, either one is fine. The only other recommendation is you don't want to interchange them. If you add the Pfizer vaccine, 
get the F second Pfizer. If you had the Moderna, you get the second Moderna. So that right now, these messenger RNA vaccines are not interchangeable. But again, that's a lot of administrative uh, behind the scenes things. And that's it's really doesn't have to be uh, related to what you guys have to have to remember or tell your loved ones. Um, as far as as far as uh, booster dosing, no data yet uh, that I can tell you. Uh, I scour the uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine's American Academy of Family Practice CDC websites and at the present time, there's just no mention of when, when and if we will need to receive a, a booster vaccine. I guess if I put my physician hat on from past experience, more than likely uh, there'll be a booster vaccine at some point in time down the road, but whether that's at a year, two years, three years, just don't know, but we will know that at some point in time when more data is available. Um, you hear questions about uh, what if I've already had COVID and do I need to get the vaccine? So the current recommendation by CDC is that if you've had a COVID infection documented with a COVID antigen test or a PCR test, it is recommended that you receive a uh, the vaccine series. We know that natural immunity does occur, but it can vary from patient to patient to patient. And we just don't know how long natural immunity occurs and how long it's strong enough to ward off or protect you from a future infection. What we do know, the most up-to-date data from the CDC is that if you've had a COVID infection, the risk of a reinfection within the first three to four months now is extremely, extremely low. These patients are now found to be very, very protected with natural immunity for about three to four months. After that, we just don't, again, have enough data and follow in enough patients, but I'll assume that it might even be out to six months. But the current recommendation now is if you had a COVID-19 infection and the vaccine is available to you, you can go ahead and, and uh, get the vaccine. So what about the timing from having a COVID shot of uh, infection to receiving the vaccine? The most current CDC data, which was this weekend, states that if you're healthy, you recover from your COVID shot uh, infection, and you're now out of isolation, you can get the vaccine at any point in time when it becomes available to you. And that may vary location to location and based on age, but there is no waiting time period. If on the other hand, you had a COVID infection, but did require a certain treatment, and we call those antibody treatments, whether that was an infusion of convalescent plasma, somebody's donated plasma uh, who had antibodies from a previous COVID infection or synthetic antibody treatment uh, called BAM, which is administered both through Quincy Medical Group as well as Blessing Hospital, they recommend waiting 90 days in order to um, uh, receive the vaccine. We know that the half-life of these antibodies last quite a long time and that you're protected for outwards of 90 days. We just don't know what kind of an effect those antibody infusions can have on you as a patient developing an immune response to the COVID vaccine. So they they really recommend because of the fact that you know your, your risk of COVID infection within 90 days is low, they just recommend in that instance, if you receive those treatments, that you basically put off the vaccine for at least uh, uh, 90 days. Um, what about if you want to get the vaccine, but you've been directly exposed to COVID? So your spouse who isn't getting the vaccine now, but you're able to get it, and all of a sudden your spouse comes down with uh, a COVID infection, and now you have to quarantine. So the current recommendation by the CDC is finish your quarantine, Nowadays, 10, maybe 14 days, but about 10 days. And then after that, if you are symptom free and the vaccine is available, it is okay to go ahead and get the vaccine. It is also okay to get the vaccine if you've had the first shot and you've then had a direct exposure after the first shot. Again, they want you to wait your 10 to 14 days and then go ahead and finish off with the second vaccine. If you're a patient unlucky enough to have had um, the first vaccine, but then developed a COVID infection in the three to four weeks um, succeed or uh, following that first vaccine, they recommend again, simply quarantining 
and then going ahead and um, uh, or isolating and then going ahead and finish up the second series with the second vaccine. So essentially what you're hearing is get vaccinated when the time becomes available. The CDC wants as many people to become vaccinated as possible. Uh, and there are very, very few contraindications and we'll just hit on those lightly uh, uh, as we move on. Um, as far as a couple uh, main topics for people is what about if you're pregnant or what if you're breastfeeding? The COVID vaccine, uh, according to the, to the experts, uh, they do not feel that the messenger RNA vaccines of which the COVID are, they have any effect on a developing fetus as well as the pregnant uh, patients. So they recommend that, that whether you're pregnant at any of the uh, trimester stage, that if uh, you have the ability to receive the vaccine, they recommend going ahead and getting that vaccine. We do know that the pregnant uh, person or the pregnant patient does have somewhat of a higher risk of experiencing a severe COVID infection if they were unlucky enough to get COVID. So the CDC is really recommending um, based on expert input that these patients consider receiving that COVID vaccine. And the same can be said for breastfeeding. Um, the messenger RNA vaccines, um, they do not contain a live virus. They do not affect uh, a patient's DNA, whether you as the, um, the, the, the woman who, the female patient who's breastfeeding or the infant who's breastfeeding that, uh, that the, uh, the COVID vaccine has any adverse effects. So they recommend in breastfeeding, go ahead and receive the vaccine and that's not a contraindication. So there's probably been a lot of you that have uh, heard misinformation about uh, the vaccine reactions uh, that are out there in the media. Um, so remember that you want to be really careful with national media. Um, they have a reason to report things. Uh, you want to be careful on misinformation. So again, I would recommend, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if that's of interest to you, head over to the CDC site. But the adverse reactions that we're seeing right now, uh, I believe that then uh, the first 1.9 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, the two major types of reactions we found were what we call local and systemic. Local reactions are simply some pain, swelling at the injection site, um, maybe a little redness at the injection site, but not a hive. Some people developed um, um, a little bit of, uh, of a headache, um, uh, but most people uh, did extremely well. And then you have what we call the systemic reaction. And that's where people can develop the body aches, the fever, and the general fatigue and really wiped out feeling. We know that uh, both the local and the systemic reactions, if they're gonna occur, expect them to occur within the first one to two to three days. And if you get them, they will only last one to three days. So it's not a long time. It can be treated with Tylenol and Motrin. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, you know, those are things that uh, you can expect. We do know that they tend to have a little bit of higher frequency after the second uh, dose of the vaccine rather than after the first dose. I have already been vaccinated. I use myself as an example. Um, I had a little bit of arm pain uh, following the first injection that lasted a day. And I had a little bit of arm pain for about a day and a half, but I did not have e any other local or systemic reactions. Also in the media, you hear things like anaphylaxis. An anaphylaxis reaction is where a patient develops a very severe systemic reaction. Those patients can develop hives. They can develop facial swelling. They can develop uh, swelling of the throat, uh, shortness of breath, cough, wheeze, and even develop nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, we know within the first 1.9 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, the current rate of anaphylaxis um, is about 11 cases per 1 million dosages. So it doesn't happen very often. And what is, um, what is very interesting is they really did not notice any anaphylaxis during the va er early vaccine trials, they've started to notice a few as the number of dosages have been administered. So that is a, a potential risk, uh, which is why when you go to receive the vaccine, you may have already noticed this or have heard that the, uh, the, the vaccinating centers will monitor you as a patient for 15 minutes prior to releasing you uh, to go back to work or to go home. If you have a history 
of a previous anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine or an injectable therapy that is not a contraindication to receive in the COVID vaccine, they will monitor you for 30 minutes because the vast majority of these reactions will occur within a 30 minute time period of receiving that injection. And that can occur both either at the first or the second injection. And I also want to reassure all of you that no matter where you are at, at uh, in a vaccinating center, the, the, um, the centers are well equipped to um, treat and monitor for anaphylactic reactions. So they have all the medications that are available there. They have direct access to EMS teams and they would more than likely, if you're developing anything like that, uh, treat you aggressively and then transport you to a local facility, such as if we're here in Quincy, Illinois, would be Blessing Hospital Emergency Room where they would monitor you. But uh, at the present time, luckily we have not had anyone that's had that. But again, all the vaccinating centers are required in order uh, to, to uh, have that on hand if that, if that were to happen, as well as trained medical staff. So true contraindications. Um, it's not an allergy to penicillin. It's not food allergies. It is an allergy to any of the components of the messenger RNA vaccine. Um, now, you might ask yourself, well, heck, what are those? Uh, well, there's about four major components that are in the vaccine. And I always just tell my patients, if you've never had a vaccine allergic reaction, such as an anaphylactic reaction or to an IV therapy, then you really don't have any contraindication to having the vaccine. Um, it's, it's not related to food allergies. It's not related to asthma. Uh, I just had a young lady ask me today if uh, she could get it if she has a penicillin allergy and you can go ahead and, and receive the vaccine. I also, as a physician, that if, if there was ever a question, and I know that, that physicians and vaccinating centers will tell this to patients, if there's ever a question, we can always refer you prior to getting your first vaccination to our um, allergists uh, in, uh, in, the, in the area to be further evaluated. They can do specific testing to, to ensure that, uh, that you would be safe to receive the vaccine. So there really, really is very, very little contraindication. Now, one of the biggest is if you had a reaction to the first vaccine and you had a significant anaphylactic reaction, it's totally contraindicated to receive the vac the second vaccine. So you will you would not be able to receive that second vaccine. Okay, um, and then basically why vaccinate? From a medical standpoint, we want to vaccinate so that we can reduce risk of disease in patients. We want to reduce hospitalizations. We want to reduce complications, and we want to reduce deaths. Uh, we want to reduce the hospital overload uh, to the system, economically and socially. Uh, we hope to vaccinate as many people so that we can return economy and social life back to as much of a norm as possible and as quickly as possible. Um, you know, when you when you read uh, all the experts, you know, that's probably not going to occur until later 2021, maybe early 2022. Um, what we are attempting to do is vaccinate as many people um, so that we can develop what we call in medicine, and you've probably heard the experts uh, refer to a, uh, a trend called, um, a trend called uh, herd immunity. And herd immunity is where you vaccinate enough patients over a period of time, as well as enough patients re um, develop the infection over time and recover and therefore have natural immunity that the virus itself no longer has enough hosts in order to survive. And therefore what happens at that point in time is we significantly see um, infectivity rates drop, uh, hospitalizations and all the complications of COVID uh, drop. And at that point in time, we hope to renew our economy and our social uh, uh, lives back to uh, a normalization. Um, as I mentioned earlier, natural immunity can vary from patient to patient. So the CDC recommends uh, continuing to, to really truly consider being vaccinated even if you had COVID-19. And then just a, a few frequent questions that I get in my office, uh, whether in office or phone calls, is um, does, uh, does, the vaccine, does the vaccine prevent transmission of the disease? At the present time, the, the, two, the two vaccines in their trials did not look at transmission rate 
uh, of the virus. What they looked at was antibody and protection rates. So there's really not a lot of data out there yet that shows that if you receive the two doses of vaccine, are you still able to transmit the virus? And depending on who you're speaking to and depending on where you're reading, there's, uh, there's just some different thought process on there. But the best I can tell you right now is we don't have data that, that uh, means that would show us that if I'm fully vaccinated, am I able to transmit uh, the virus if I were to come in contact with it to someone else? So we just don't know that, uh, which leads me to the second frequently asked questions. Do I still have to wear a mask? Do I have to wash my hands? Yes. And do we have to social distance? Yes. Uh, we have to do that until at least we have the experts uh, in their best guesstimate that we've had enough people immunized and vaccinated that we were able to loosen the reins on that. So please, please continue to encourage uh, yourselves and, uh, and the people you know, the people that are close to you and you love to continue to abide by the CDC guidelines. Um, just uh, uh, to, uh, a couple other, the messenger RNA vaccines, they do not change your DNA. They do not enter the cells of your body, so they aren't going to, you know, change anything like that. Uh, so they are safe, and they definitely, because they do not contain a live virus, they do not give you COVID-19 infection. So these are, this is an exciting time. We're using, with messenger RNA vaccines, we're using technology that has been used in the treatment of certain cancers, and now flipped it over for the vaccine world. So more to come. It's a continually fluid situation, uh, but a very interesting one if you're in medicine. So I really thank you all. Um, and if you have any questions, just feel free to ask them. Dr. Noble, I do have a question here in the chat and then I'll turn it over to Joy to help us answer some of the questions coming through our uh, Facebook Live. The first one I have here are, what are your thoughts on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that is being considered for emergency use author? use authorization? So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, again, um, the FDA has little minimal um, you know, rec or, uh, information on it because the, the committee or their, the advisory committee on immunization practices will look at it prior to immediately releasing it under the emergency use authorization. But the one, the one advantage, obviously, I think for mass immunization is it's a one injection. Okay, so that would be a benefit to it. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, where it kind of plays out. Uh, but I would expect um, what I've read and what I've heard, um, I just talked to um, our newest infectious disease uh, physician who will be coming to Quincy in uh, July. And she's excited about the fact that it's a, it's a, one, it's a one shot vaccine, which definitely would benefit uh, compliance with getting vaccinated. Thank you for that. Um, so we had a couple of questions come um, via Facebook Live. Uh, one of them is, do we consider it safe for those with autoimmune issues to uh, take the vaccine? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm going to, the answer to that question is I'll group the autoimmune patients in with any other immunocompromised patient. Um, and I will say that during the vaccine trials, they did enroll. HIV stable patients. So patients who were not experiencing uh, uh, an acute flare up of HIV, but are basically receiving therapies that would immunocompromise these individuals. And the autoimmune patient falls into the similar immunocompromised uh, patient. Yes, the CDC presently recommends that those patients uh, receive the vaccination and that it's safe to receive the vaccination in those instances. A uh, second question here was, um, is this the kind of vaccine that we will need to get yearly, uh, like the flu shot? That's another great question. Uh, and right now, um, we don't know the data on that. Uh, we don't have data. Again, it's one of those fluid situations where we'll be following those thousands and thousands of patients um, with antibody levels to to see if uh, if they uh, the the antibody levels remain at a level they feel comfortable with inducing immunity, but on the flip side, we've already read and heard about viruses are smart, and as we uh, attempt to develop vaccinations and immunity, 
they basically get smarter and they they in medicine what we they begin to mutate and as they begin to mutate they change form and they change um, their infectivity and so similar to if we analogize the coronavirus which is which is the class of viruses of which the covid virus the novel covid virus falls into very similar to the influenza virus the reason we immunize each and every year for influenza is because there are new strains of influenza that appear each and every year so we have to basically re-immunize against those predominant strains of either the A or the B. And so already the COVID virus is mutating in different parts of the world. And at this point in time, more than likely, that'll be a driving force for uh, vaccine companies to continually probably, and I would have to see if I put my hat on, that we're probably gonna see uh, whether it becomes a yearly to an every other year uh, vaccine similar to influenza. Thank you. Uh, last question that came up here is, when do we anticipate a vaccine for children? There is really um, another good question. There's really, uh, I know they're probably working on that behind the scenes, but there is no, I couldn't even answer that question right now. And there's nothing on the, nothing that I can find on the horizon that uh, is, is for children at the present time. And luckily and thank goodness, our children tend to tolerate a COVID infection very, very well. Um, and they do extremely well. And yes, there's outliers, but thank goodness, those are the age groups that do extremely well, but nothing that I can find on the horizon right now. That is all I had on the Facebook Live at this moment. I have another uh, question it looks like here in our chat, and it says, I've been told that if we experience an adverse reaction and seek medical treatment, our insurance will not cover that. Is that true? I didn't hear the last part of that question, Jared. Yeah, it says, I've been told that if we experience an adverse reaction and seek medical treatment, our insurance will not cover that. Is that true? Yes. So basically, I believe that the your private insurance, from what I understand, your private insurance may not cover that because it's uh, because of the fact that it's probably not in your in your plan uh, when you when when they wrote up your insurance, you know, how many years ago. But I believe that that anything like that is being covered um, uh, under the, the by the federal uh, guidelines under emergency use author, authorization of the vaccine. Um, because they are attempting to collect as much data as they can. I know that um, that the uh, CDC is recommending as many patients sign up to the v, the the Vax text, which is a free uh, text uh, messaging. That if you have any adverse uh, events, you can directly report them to the uh, CDC's uh, adverse uh, event uh, committee. And I believe that um, uh, that the cost of healthcare to an adverse reaction uh, would eventually be covered under uh, federal guidelines. Very good, thank you for your help in answering that. If anyone has any questions uh, that have not been placed in the chat and you would like to take yourself off mute at this time, go ahead and take yourself off mute and we can try to get those answered. I would add one other to the autoimmune um, is that um, these patients who are immunocompromised and are receiving certain types of therapy, whether it's chemotherapy or immunotherapy, um, uh, other antibiotic and antibody treatments, they are still um, uh, very. They are still uh, recommended to get the vaccine. So there is no waiting time period. So if you are simply have a a, a process that requires treatment, you do not need to wait the ninety day. Um, um, uh, uh, current uh, recommendations for the COVID treatment, uh, you can get that vaccine at any point in time. So there is no delay in that. Very good, thank you. As I mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to take yourself off mute and you can ask Dr. Noble. Seems you have covered quite a few things here. Uh, Bill, it looks like you took yourself off mute. Do you have a question? Yeah, just real, real quickly. Um, 
the uh, I think they're called the mono monoclonal antibody infusion. Is that available in Quincy? Is it being used in the early stages of diagnosis? Yes, absolutely, Bill. Great question. So that is. That um, is an FDA approved under the emergency use authorization as a treatment, an active treatment for an active documented COVID-19 infection. So we are using it um, here at Quincy Medical Group. We were we at Quincy Medical Group are one of only two multi-specialty groups across the state of Illinois to receive um, uh, the monoclonal antibody from Illinois Department of Public Health. So we we receive approximately 25 to 30 dosages each and every week. And Blessing Hospital um, also uh, receives a weekly uh, doses. So between uh, Blessing Hospital and Quincy Medical Group, we are actively treating patients who meet that criteria. There is a strict uh, a list of criteria uh, for patients who are COVID-19 positive to receive that treatment. So that is a question that, and this is what I mentioned to all my patients. You as a patient don't necessarily need to know if you meet the criteria. All you really need to know is if I'm documented with COVID-19, I'm gonna reach out to my primary care provider and or the COVID hotline, whether it's at Quincy Medical Group or Blessing Hospital to find out if I qualify and, and to receive that treatment. We know that COVID-19 is something that we've really never seen before. Patients don't do very, I mean, they, they have very few symptoms day one through day five. And then all of a sudden they can fall off a cliff just like that and get really, really sick. So what we're attempting to do is identify those patients early, stressing to them, you know what, give me a call. We'll review the criteria. And if you are, if you're having any little bit of symptom, I would rather treat you at day one, two or three and not wait until you get sick. So yes, those treatments are being performed each and every day. Uh, I can tell you that at Quincy Medical Group, we're infusing six to eight patients each and every day. Thank you. Um, I had one more pop up in the Facebook Live. Can you get it if you are having a viral flare like shingles? Great question. Um, so the current recommendation is because the COVID vaccine is new and the CDC and the FDA don't wanna kind of muddy the waters, they are recommending that um, you attempt to space the COVID vaccine approximately 14 days from any, uh, any other vaccine that may be recommended to you, whether that's an influenza shot, a tetanus update, or the shingles vaccine. So if you're planning my recommendation to all my patients is that if you're if you are of the age range or if the covid vaccine becomes available i recommend getting the covid vaccine and then waiting at least 14 days based on cdc guidelines to receive any other vaccine now that being said we always in medicine weigh the risk and the benefit so if that second vaccine was needed to, to really protect an individual, then you always have to weigh the benefit of giving that second vaccine closer than 14 days. But in many cases, we vaccinate just simply for protection. And so I would recommend the 14 day time period right now. Thank you. Uh, one other question, if you've had the pneumonia vaccine, is it possible you may have some lung immunity? There is none. Uh, the pneumonia vaccine is specific to a bacteria called the pneumococcal bacteria, and that uh, that immunity to the pneumococcus does not carry over to the uh, to the to the COVID or coronavirus. Thank you. As we start to close out the Q and A portion here, I have a couple more questions. One from our private messenger: Is there any link between the vaccine and infertility in the future, or have those claims been debunked? So at the present time, uh, and according to the CDC uh, website, there is no link to any infertility at the present time. Perfect, thank you. And it looks like there's one in the chat here. Of the patients in Adams County who have died from COVID, how many had no underlying conditions that you're aware of? So I don't know the exact 
uh, answer to, uh, I just couldn't answer that, uh, you know, uh, 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 exactly, but I believe that the vast majority of the age range was very typical of uh, the COVID uh, uh, or the patients who are at risk of severe COVID infection. Those are the 80 year old uh, patients and above. Very good, thank you. That now concludes our Q&A portion of this. I wanna say thank you everyone for joining us this morning. A huge thank you to Absolutely. Dr. Rick Noble for joining us. As always, we are here to serve our community and are looking forward to a brighter and better day when we can all come together again. If you have any additional questions, feel free to email me, jared at quincychamber.org, jared, J-A-R-I-D. And uh, I can try to reload, relay those to Dr. Rick Noble and he might be able to help us out still if he is willing. Uh, but thank you so much, Dr. Rick Noble for joining us today. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Everyone be safe, have a great week.